to start off by just sharing uh, my heart a little bit. Um, number one, I just want to thank all of you guys. Um, Chanel and I personally have gone through one of the most challenging times this year and uh, all brought on by myself, amen? And I want to thank you guys because moving here has been not only just a healing experience for me personally, uh, but in a lot of ways, a restoration of heart. And I wanna say a special thank you to Jason and Sarah. Um, you guys have been friends to us. You've shown us unlimited grace and you continue to be there for us as we continue to heal. And uh, you know, it's still a process. And one thing I appreciate, one of my fathers in the faith, Corey Blackwell always says, you know, we're all working on our testimony. And I look forward to sharing more about this time um, in the future, amen. But I wanna start off with a word of prayer and we'll get into things today. Father God, uh, Lord, we want to come before you, and uh, one, I just want to express gratitude. I, I, I don't deserve to preach your word, uh, God, for what I've done to your son. And Lord, it's amazing to be able to stand here and have your grace. Thank you for your family around the world. Uh, thank you for all the brothers and sisters who uh, and comforted us when we didn't need, deserve the comfort, God, who gave us those hugs. And Lord, uh, Father, God, thank you for calling us to reach your generation and choosing us to be your people, Father God. You didn't have to choose us, Father, but you invite us into your work. And right now, Lord, I pray that, God, this will be a sermon that people don't remember me. They remember you, Jesus Christ. I pray right now, Father, you dispatch your angels to surround this building. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God, and I pray that as I preach your word, if there's something I planned, God, that's not of you, remove it, God. Silence my lips. But if there's something, God, that I didn't plan and you want to speak, speak through me, Father. God, we cast all anxiety, all the things we have to do later this afternoon, the things maybe we're worried about, we bring it to the cross, and Father, we want to be clay in your hands. Lead this lesson, Father, and help us to walk out forever changed. It's in Jesus' Jesus mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, let's start off and ask, how are you doing spiritually? Amen. How close are you to Jesus? And it's kind of interesting when you hear that question, you tend to think, how's my evangelism? How is my sacrificial giving and my contribution? But today I want to study a parable Jesus tells us that really shows us the heart of our spirituality before Christ. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now we talk about in the discipleship study how important last words are and how Jesus gave his last words, that great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, amen? And also equally important is we find Jesus' last words, if you will, his last sermon before he's about to go to the cross, known as the Olivet Discourse. He then tells after that his last parables, one of which we're gonna study. And so we know last words are important. This is something we wanna pay attention to. And I believe we are in a spiritual war and that there are even demons here trying to distract you from the scriptures. We're in a spiritual war. And I believe today the Holy Spirit's going to work in a way where you will walk out forever changed because of the power of God's word. Jesus is here in Matthew 24 in verse 1. It says, Jesus left the temple and walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Well, here are the disciples, they're at the temple, which Herod had built upon, beautiful building that was shined with brilliance, where the animal sacrifices were offered. And Jesus goes, this temple is going to be totally brought down. And you imagine this was the center of their worship. They're going, what? And you know how it is when you don't want to ask a question in front of the rest of the class, amen? And so the disciples, they pulled you aside. They go, hey, what did you mean about that? Are you talking about the end of the world? Are you talking about the end of Jerusalem? And he goes on and he says, listen, here's the thing. In verse 34, if you drop down, 
He says, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. So all the previous verses deal with what's going to happen in the lifetime of the apostles. And he goes, before the temple's destroyed, there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be people that come and teach a different Jesus in a different spirit. Amen. And we know that's going to be for all time. Amen. But then he says in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Amen. Of course, the church starts in Acts 2. 3,000 are baptized. 5,000 men are added. And Acts chronicles the gospel spreading all around the known world to where Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, every creature under heaven heard the gospel. Doesn't mean everyone became a Christian, for we know the road is narrow. But they accomplished the mission, the last words of Jesus, that every soul heard about God's movement at that time. And that is the mission, if you're busy with us, that is the mission of the church, and we're inviting you to join that movement. Are you with me right here? To get the gospel to the ends of the earth in their generation. Then they asked the second question, well, what's the sign of your return? And when you're going to come? And Jesus goes on, verses 35 and on, no one knows when that's going to happen. No one, not even the Son of Man. God set a time for Jesus to return. And in his last words, if you will, he goes in to tell a parable about the ten virgins, which you may be familiar with, where five were prepared and the others weren't. And the lesson is be prepared, amen? And that sermon is for the disciples. Then he tells another parable for the disciples, as we know, the parable of the talents or the ten bags of gold. That deals with the disciples again, using their different gifts and their skill set to proclaim the gospel. But then he ends with this parable that deals not just with the Christians, but with all mankind. Let's read Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He'll sit on His glorious throne and all nations will be gathered before Him and He'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those that is right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed a clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those to his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal file prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. But I said, Lord, when do we see you hungry? And when do we see you thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or in sick, or in prison, and did not help you? The reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The title of the sermon is Cursed or Blessed. You choose, amen. Cursed or Blessed. You know, the Bible teaches in Hebrews 6 that Judgment Day is one of the elementary teachings. For me, one of the main reasons I became a disciple was because I didn't want to go to hell. And today there are not many pulpits that are preaching about that final day and getting prepared for it. You know, this last parable in some ways is more than a parable, it's a prophecy about the last day when all nations are gathered around the throne. And that's the first point. All nations gathered before the throne. 
you know, if all nations are going to be gathered before the throne, this is a meeting you will not be late to, amen? This is one you're not going to miss. You can't take a sick day on. You are going to be present, and all nations will be gathered. So that means we need to give all nations a chance. Are you with me right here, brothers and sisters? And Jesus is in his glory, just like they saw him in the Mount of Transfiguration. No longer in humiliation or human form or as a baby, but now as the king of the world. The first time it's referenced to in Matthew. No one will miss this day. And we got to wrestle as a church with how serious we are about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And our core conviction that it needs to be in this lifetime, as we saw in Matthew 24. There are churches out there that may teach the plan of salvation, but they don't have a united plan to get it, the word of God out to all nations. Romans chapter 2, if you'll turn there. You ever wonder, well, what about the guy in the Amazon who doesn't have the Word of God? Is it really fair for God to judge him? Years ago, you might have remembered watching on the news, they actually discovered a tribe that had not had human contact flying over the Amazon. And there's a video of it out there of a helicopter or a plane going over and you kind of see these people with this like white powder all over them like pointing up like, you know what I mean? Like, what is that? It's shocking. There are people that never had outside human contact still on this planet. There are people that don't know Jesus, even in his name. Now, you and I know as disciples of Jesus, that there are tons of people that claim to know Christ, but never had a church that's preaching the word of God in their city. But what about that person that, quote unquote, doesn't get the chance? Well, Romans 2 verse 12, it says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those indeed who obey, obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness in their thoughts, sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares, the day he separates the goats and the sheep. There's two types of people in this world. There's those who don't have the Bible or don't know about the word of God. And there's those of us who are religious who have the Bible and know the word of God. He says, you're going to be judged by God's law. Now, can any of us live up perfectly to all the commands of God? No. And so, by conclusion, we are guilty. I forgot, brother read this scripture in verse 13. He, he messaged it out. He's like fired up. He goes in verse 13. For it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. God, we got to obey the law. That's how we're going to be declared righteous. I go, bro, that, that scripture in context is trying to make the point no one can fully. And we are required to be obedient. Amen. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But, but on our best day... It's not enough for God. I don't care if your mother Teresa, your grandma, Pastor Bob back at home. It's not enough. What about the guy in the jungle? Well, he says they have the conscience. And the conscience has the law of God written on it. That's why I don't believe in such thing as atheists. They're just liars full of sin that have convinced themselves not to believe in God. Psalm 14 says because they have vile evil deeds. And that's why you start preaching God's word at them. They all of a sudden start believing in God. Are you with me right here? But because they're going to be judged by their conscience. Can anyone say they've lived up to their conscience? No, in fact, it even says at one time it accused them, but it starts defending you and your evil actions. There are tribes that are born. Everyone has a sense of right and wrong, but then they become cannibals or they, they you know, things, just crazy stuff. All are lost. And Romans 10 teaches, unless someone brings them the gospel, they don't have a chance. If we don't do it, no one else will. And why since the first century has generation come and gone, come and gone, and no one's evangelized the world. 
we are God's chosen people for this hour to do this. Are you with me right here? All nations will be gathered before the throne. And we know, according to Romans chapter 3, verses 23, for all have fallen short. We all need the blood of Christ. And what's amazing when we see these six souls baptized today, what happens according to Romans chapter 6 is that you die with Christ in that watery tomb. And because Christ shed his blood on the cross, you come in contact with the glorious blood of Christ that wipes away those sins. So on that judgment day, we are clear, amen? And then you come up and you live a new life. And as 1 John 5 verse 3 says, the water, the blood, and the spirit are all in agreement together, amen? Why am I sharing this? Well, some people have taken Matthew 25 to teach that what we might call a social gospel that if you just read it alone, it goes, oh, well, the people that help the poor, help the sick, do good things, they're welcome into heaven. And the people that don't, well, they're the ones going to hell. And how many people have you met that you ask, hey, are you going to heaven or hell? And, you know, maybe don't ask it just like that. But anyway. <laughs> we do surveys on campus sometimes. And they go, well, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah. They bought into that. So we're gonna find in Matthew 25, it's not a prescription on how to be saved, it's a description of the saved. And what they look like, and what they do. You know, it's not enough just about doing good works. Have you obeyed the gospel? Many of you are studying the Bible right now and you need to get baptized into Christ. And yet you're holding on to things that have no value in them. As my wife shared, the, the, these things lead to destruction and emptiness. Some people believe that God will just evangelize the world magically. That, oh, well, God's in control. I actually, in theory, don't believe that statement. Now, before I'm called some heretic or something like that. <laughs> he chooses not to be in control. And this is important. I don't control my wife. We would call that abusive if I was controlling. I'm sovereign over her in leadership. And so I have to lead her, I have to prompt her, and she willingly chooses to follow me, but she doesn't have to. And so God is sovereign over his church. He's the king of his church, but he's not gonna force you to go help the poor and force you to live on the sick and heal people because he loves you and he wants to give you a free choice. And so we gotta get rid of this thinking. You know, it's like the people that go, well, God will bring the right spouse at his right time for me. Like there's one chosen out there. Well, listen, if you don't ever go on dates, it's just not gonna happen, buddy. And you're gonna be standing there thinking you had the gift at 90, and God's like, I would have helped you out. I would have led you. Because he's sovereign. I am so fired up to be here in LA. Like if I think about it enough, I get him, I've said some prayer walks, and, and my heart just is so moved to be witnessing what we're witnessing. LA had their greatest week of baptisms in its history this past Sunday. With 20 souls added to God's kingdom. More than a GLC. Not only that, the greatest month we've had. A 62 added. And finally, by the power of God, we blasted through 1,000. And that doesn't count all the mission teams sent off from this church. Bangkok, Thailand, and Lincoln, Nebraska, Dallas, Fort Worth, and the, the, the supplemental teams of Denver, Colorado, all that stuff, all the missionaries we've sent out. And what this church has sacrificed over the years. And you got naysayers out there, and persecutors, who will come against God's people who are his enemies. As, oh, people are leaving, or oh, that church, it's now just a thousand, have no idea the history of this church, no context, and these are enemies of God's people. There is revival going on right now. We are about to break the 11,000 barrier as God's movement. People are getting saved all over the place. Don't let Satan cloud out you out with all the noise that's garbage out there. You know, Philippians chapter 2, if you'll turn there, please. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. 
A verse for many years I didn't understand that kind of freaked me out. In uh, chapter 2 and verse 12, you know, you got those verses that scare you. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, verse 12 says, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, and I believe we could say that about the City of Angels Church, amen, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. I read this verse as a young Christian as, you better work to earn your salvation because any day you could be lost. And when I sinned that day, I go, oh, I'm not a Christian anymore. And when I got open about it, I go, oh, I'm saved again. And then the moment I walked out and had that lustful thought or lied or whatever, oh, I'm damned to hell again, you know? And I just go, you know something? Th th that just doesn't seem right. What's this verse mean? Well, there's two people at work here. It says God is at work in you to prompt you and to move you to fulfill his good purpose. And so our response then as he works in us, since our salvation is in our hearts, is to work it out to others. To work out your salvation. Kind of like when you get a knot in your, your shoulder maybe and you need a massage from your spouse to like work it out. Are you with me right here? You gotta work out that salvation to others, amen? You've been saved and so there's, with that gratitude and that love, we want to share this gospel with every single person in the world. And I love when the Holy Spirit works in sharing your faith. I mean, the other day I was on a prayer walk and there was a woman walking around and I walked past her. And you know how when you walk past somebody and you're trying to like, struggling a little bit because you go, I know I should share with that person. Well, the scriptures does say, Jesus said, don't talk to anyone along the road as you go out to greet them. And you're trying to kind of wrestle with yourself to justify it. And then you got to be the weird creep, right? That like goes back and like, you know, runs back. That's what I did. And I uh, invited her out to church. Didn't get her phone number or anything like that. Just gave her my card that had my wife and I's phone number. And, and uh, that was it. I go, amen, did that. Moved on. Um, at Bible Talk, she shows up. Uh, she's currently studying the Bible, amen. Hitting some roadblocks because you're going to stand right now before the, the, the judgment day. Yeah. And if you're here right now, amen, repent, amen. <laughs> um, James chapter 2, if you'll turn there, please. In James chapter 2, I, I can't find a verse really in the Bible that says we're going to be judged by our hearts. Yeah. You ever hear people, no, God's going to judge my heart. You don't know what you're talking about and all this stuff. Um, there's a verse in Hebrews that says the word of God judges the heart, meaning we preach the word of God and make judgments on each other in a spiritual sense, different than hypocritical judging, which Jesus talks about in Matthew 7. But the Bible continually says over and over again, that we're judged by our deeds. The Greek word can mean deeds, actions, all that different stuff. You say, well, why is that? I thought we don't have to earn our salvation. Well, your actions, according to Jesus, are a reflection of your heart. And this can be a very scary thing for some people or very encouraging, because a lot of us are hit with false accusations in our minds and, and hearts and false guilt, but you look at the way you live, you go, that person has a good heart. They really want to do good or they wouldn't even feel that guilt. Your choices, and this is the reason Jesus is justified on judging us when he returns about how we're living presently is because it's a sum result of all the choices you've made up until this point. And so on that great day, the second point is there's going to be a great separation of the flock. In James 2 and verse 1, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes in your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. 
If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Well, that one challenges our church culture sometimes. Yeah. Now, if you drop down to verse eight, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted as a law breakers. Um, we saw in the parable that God is concerned about us taking care of one another and having a deep love for one another. Just as I felt a deep healing love from you guys as I came here sick and wounded, and yet you took me in. And Jesus is going to be able to say, you didn't do that for Mike and Chanel. You did that for me. And I know I am grateful, but I got to give it back. And in verse 14, it says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Now, we read this a lot about repentance and baptism, and it applies. But verse 15 says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action is dead. And we know even the demons believe, but they don't help the poor. They don't help people. And so Jesus is challenging us, the half-brother. Jesus, I should say, James, through the Spirit, is challenging us, do we take care of people? And if we don't, it shows we don't have true faith. Now, notice with the great separation on Matthew 25, notice that in each group, the sheep and the goats, each one is what they are. Meaning this, Jesus didn't make them sheep or make them goats. We think of Judgment Day sometimes as like an exam or a test where it's like, okay, let me evaluate your life right now and see what you did. No, Jesus says Judgment Day is just a separation of who you already are. He divides them as he sees them because the good deeds of love overflow from who the person we are in Christ. And in Israel in this time, the sheep and goats, you couldn't really distinguish them. They looked very similar and especially at night. And so the shepherd would have to have close inspection to figure out which one's a sheep and which one's a goat. And this shows us that Christ is closely inspecting our hearts. He does care about how we live. Are you with me right here? And he closely inspects so he can separate the goats from the sheep. If we're to be like Christ, this is why we have discipling because we inspect one another, amen? We point out things and love in one another so that on that great separation, we can be who we need to be, amen? How's your discipling going? Are you having good discipleship times every week where you're getting into the scriptures and there's a meal being prepared of the Word of God? Or are they cheap McDonald's type quiet times where you just kind of stay in the first principles and that's all you do? Yeah. To inspect, you've got to ask the right questions. Yeah. How are your quiet times? Come on, bro. Oh, they're going good. And then we just move on. That's not inspection. Now, I'm not saying you got to have a light there. Where were you the day of July 25th? You know, some type of interrogation or something like that. This is based on love and friendship. But the brother, go, oh, the quiet times are good. I got the verse of the day from you version or whatever, Bible app. Oh, Bro, that doesn't cut it. How's your purity? Oh, I struggle with some stuff on YouTube. What's that mean, bro? Oh, so you're talking pornography. You don't ask the right questions, you can't inspect and help people with their hearts. You know, we need to understand that this passage is a prescription in Matthew 25, not a description. I'm sorry, it's not a prescription, but a description of how Christians leave, live. Sheep and goats are not made sheep, and goats, by judgment, that's who they already were before the judgment. It's their identity. Therefore, judgment's not a threat if you're a true Christian. And this is why the Bible says we shouldn't fear. I, you know, it's funny to me. Anytime I preach, you know, you go, hey, turn to Revelation. And they're like, oh, my goodness, you know. The true disciples fired up about it. The true disciples, it says in Luke, stand high, your redemption draws near. You're excited about the end times. You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm like, man, this is exciting. I hope this is it. 
I get to go be with Jesus. Yeah, there might be some death and, you know, that sort of thing. Amen! I get to go be with my Lord. Now, back in Matthew 25, if you look in verse 2, notice he says, whatever you did for one of these brothers and sisters of mine. So is he talking about for the lost or the church specifically in context? The church. You see, we, how we treat each other is how we treat Jesus. How you view the church is how you view Jesus. You know, there's some people that go, well, why does the church do this? I know they've separated themselves from the flock at that point. Because you are that church. Or why does the ICC teach this? ICC, what are you talking about? We are a family. Are you with me right here? And how you talk about the family is how you're talking about Jesus. What's the church called? The body of Christ. Don't body shame Jesus. appreciate that and Christ goes whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me you know I, the, who are these sheep who are these people these these are the disciples who volunteer to come early and set everything up and they do it with a joyful heart these are our kids kingdom teachers who take care of our kids these are the ushers who, who come and they volunteer and they don't get lifted up. They don't get a pat on the back and every sermon and all this stuff. But they're here because they love God and they love his people. You know, one sister I, I appreciate so much in our Bible talk is our sister Regina. Regina, because you just see her everywhere, you know. She's got an incredible hard school load, you know, doesn't have a car, but she gets to every meeting. Yeah. She shows up here early. Uh, Chanel and I were struggling when we first moved here. You probably saw us sitting in the back a lot, and, and I was depressed. And always late to church. And so I always feared seeing Regina at the front door there. So I'm like, she's in my Bible talk, so I try to sneak, you know, this way through. So I wouldn't feel condemned, amen? I've repented, amen? But, but these people, they just love the Lord. You know, uh, I think of the people that go and help others move. Um, they're not asked to do it. I mean, isn't it great being in the kingdom? You don't really need a moving company. Like, it's pretty awesome. But do you have a joyful heart to volunteer for whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers of mine? You did for me. Now, I'm not saying disciples are the best packers Amen. and movers. Amen. I had a sister, we were moving one time. I said to the sister, hey, can you pack the refrigerator? And she's like, sure. Don't think much of it. All the disciples help pack our stuff and move into my new place. And I walk in one day and there's like water and goo stuff all over the floor, like everywhere. It's so hard to like get clean up. And I'm like, what happened? And I open up one of the boxes and the ice had been packed. <laughs> and no! I said to her, I said, sis, why'd you pack the ice? You told me to put everything in the fridge. In boxes. Go, oh, amen. She was a good sheep. She took every command literally. Amen. <laughs> Who are the goats? Goats are, are trouble. I mean, I don't know why they let kids around these things at petting zoos. You ever been, you know, at these little petting zoos and stuff? Because they nod at you and they kind of hit you. And they're just these troublesome, independent animals. They're very independent. In fact, goats can survive on their own without the shepherds, unlike sheep. Uh, goats have incredible appetites. And they will eat anything and everything to satisfy their hunger. And the shepherd has to be even careful because the mama goat will eat all of the food and not leave any for her babies and will actually like knock with you know push the babies away 
from the food. That's how selfish they are, so they can have their dinner. And anything about goats is motivated by their own desires. In fact, they love eating the shepherd's hair. This is like a thing. You have to watch out because they'll sneak up behind and try to grab a piece of the hair. For whatever reason, they like hair. And when a shepherd would go to sleep, the goats will get smart and they'll actually try to go and eat the shepherd's hair while they're sleeping to be sneaky. Because, and here's the reason why, when they taste it, they never forget that taste. So that desire drives them. And this is similar to people when they are in sin. They're driven by that desire and they refuse to let it go because it tastes so good. Selfish people don't volunteer. They don't take care of their brothers and sisters. They don't go meet them in the night for that late talk because they're struggling. So I've got to ask, are you a sheep or are you a goat? And the reply of the goats on Judgment Day just shows their pride. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger needing clothes? Just the self-justification and the pride. You know, um, spiritual growth is becoming concerned about the needs of others above yourselves. Yeah. So mark of maturity. You know, I remember when I was dating, you know, before I even dated Chanel, and I had an interest in her. I loved the way she made me feel. I remember even being at Devo's at UCLA and, and, and seeing her in the fellowship from far away, and she'd look at me, and one time she just smiled. And I just felt like... She always seemed so enthralled by my Bible knowledge. Yeah. I, made me feel good about myself. Well, we eventually get married here, as, as uh, alluded to earlier. And I remember one time getting food, going to McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever. And I come home and she's like, oh, what great, what'd you bring me? I'm like, oh no. I only got food for myself. And this happened a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> I remember one time I get McDonald's and driving up and parking and then starting to go, I go, oh my gosh, I didn't get her anything. So I just ate it in the car, amen. Like, oh, 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 oh. Come in and oh, amen. But as I matured, amen. I just love now loving Chanel and serving her, not based on any conditions or anything, but because I want to make her life great and get her to heaven. That love matures over time. And that's how we got to be with our brothers and our sisters. So are you independent? Do you do your own thing? Why are you in the church? Is it for self-serving reasons? This parable challenges us to take care of those who are in need. What about sheep? Well, it's a bad thing in the world today to be called a sheep, isn't it? You ever see that on Facebook or whatever, if you kind of put a political view or something, oh, you're such a sheep, right? And it just kind of reveals the independence that we have. And of course, we don't want to be sheep to worldly things, but we are sheep to Jesus, amen? He's our great shepherd. And sheep may look great, but the truth is they require so much help to stay alive. Uh, did you know that if a sheep falls on its back, it can't get back up? It needs the help of a shepherd or it will die. Also sheep, they have a strong tendency to panic and run. If someone honks a horn, they will run for like hours. Like hours. You can look up YouTube videos of this kind of stuff. Um, sheep will feel calm and security when the shepherd's around. They know that if it rains, the shepherd's gonna come and take care of them. Um, this is the heart of the sheep that they had in the parable. They loved one another. You know, John 10, verse 1 through 5, I'll just kind of quote it. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Yes. And he goes on to say that they don't know the voice of a stranger. In fact, they'll run from a stranger. And I think, church, we want to make sure that we know each other's voice. Yeah, come on. That we hear one another. We've got a lot of new baptisms, amen? Yeah. But do they hear your voice or have you just run on to the next baptism for self-serving needs? Or do you love them and you take care of them and you nourish them with the word of God? Are you with me right here? I want to challenge all the leaders. 
that lead Bible talks. Sometimes when people don't get back to us or they don't respond or someone's kind of missing an action and we're trying to uh, grab them, I always tell leaders, well, they're probably not following you because they don't hear your voice. And if everything's just a meeting for a study or a call about how your contribution is or a call about, you know, how come you didn't have a visitor or what's going on, they're going to be a stranger to you. And so I'm just saying that it's important, and this lesson's for me just as well. We get so involved in the business of the ministry that we need to deeply care and love each other. These guys are ready to get baptized already, amen. It's awesome. I'm only at 30 minutes. I got 45 minutes, guys, so calm down. You'll be saved soon, amen? Uh, This is important for us as leaders to make sure we take care of people. Now, Jesus in John 10 warns there are wolves. Who are the wolves, according to Jesus in Scripture? Well, we know from the Sermon on the Mount, they're false prophets and false teachers. Sometimes young Christians go, well, I want to go back to my old church, or I want to go back and talk to my old pastor that taught false doctrine, because I just want to ask questions. You wouldn't allow your child to go play with a wolf. And then these people get devoured because they're stupid and don't listen to what the Word of God says. Well, I can handle it, that independent goat. Guys, listen, I get too much into to hearing negative stuff. It affects me. What are other wolves? Sin buddies you have in the church? Isn't it interesting the people that are doing poor spiritually all kind of hang out together? And I'm not one of these people like, oh, you gotta be close to everyone in the church. There are certain people I don't want to be close to because of how they take away my faith. You know, in John 10, verse 14 through 18, he goes, I've got other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. And he says, I must, is what the word is, bring them in also. Jesus understood he must bring in all nations. He must. He was determined to go for it. You know, he goes, and they will come in. Is that pretty cool faith? You ever share your lack of faith? Kind of like me when I first moved here, you know, is, is, is you're going up to people and you're kind of like, hey man, I've got this church I go to. I know you might be busy and you're probably not, not interested, but, but what, do you, what do you think about it? Is that very responsible? They're like, okay, no. <laughs> Jesus had the heart, they must come into the sheepfold. I'm going to do whatever it takes. To accomplish this, though, we can't be hired hands. We've got to love the sheep. One scripture that's good to memorize as a, as a Christian is Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 13. And it says uh, to, that we're, we're to encourage one another. The word encourage can mean exhort one another. How often? Daily. Daily. So if you are not in communication with a disciple every day, you're in trouble. Because it goes on to say that if you don't, your heart will become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, if you're deceived, do you know you're deceived? No. Anyone can be deceived by sin. If you're being a goat and you don't have a spiritual mentor in your life that you communicate with every day, you are in trouble. You're in trouble spiritually. I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. Amen. And guys, this is back when they didn't have social media and text messages and all that stuff. They had a conviction to be in each other's lives daily. The sheep love because they love. It's just who they are. Now, some of you are sitting there, and I know some of you, you're going, preach, bro. This church is so unloving. There are people out there that believe this stuff, believe it or not. And you know what? You're just not close to God is the issue. You go, well, bro, so-and-so never had me over at their home. Well, they don't want to have you over. (laughs) And by that type of attitude on how you deal with it, why would they want to have you over? Uh, Can I just be honest? It's their decision if they don't want to be your friend. Um, Let it go. Why would you want to be with someone that doesn't want to hang out with you? Talk to them, do your part, and move on. You ever meet the sister, there's a sister in the Boston church that that always uses Matthew 18 for everything. 
Or like Matthew 18, verse 15, where it says, if your brother sins against you, go and talk to them. And they're always wanting to bring different people up on church discipline and all this stuff for every issue. And at some point you go, sis, I think the common denominator here is you. And you're looking around, you're going, everyone else thinks this church is on fire and the most loving thing they've ever experienced. And you have a problem. Sometimes we think uh, we're not bitter when in reality there's just bitterness that's come in our hearts. So today my goal is to talk about what true love is. What's another false version of love? Another wolf. Flattery. Flattery is much different than love. And disciples tend to do this with church leaders. I'm going to flatter Jason so that I can get a position in the church. Oh, bro, that was awesome. I put, you know, uh, you know I, I told everyone how great you are. And it's not a sincere love for their leader. Leaders go through very challenging things and fight wars you'll really never know about. And we got to lift up their hearts and serve them out of a place of love, not just because we want a position or something. I love Jason. He's been one of my good friends for many years, but he's becoming my best friend. Uh, because this is someone who understands ministry. I believe he's special. I believe he's chosen by God to do something great in the future and raise up a whole nother generation of soul winners. And bro, it's an honor to serve by your side, bro. Isn't it interesting how the people that flatter people, that flattery can turn into hate very fast. I'll never forget in Portland, there's a brother who wanted to be a Bible talk leader. And I met with my group and I said, hey, this brother, uh, his name was Alan, uh, uh, is going to be the Bible talk leader of the group. Um, this other brother gets so mad. We're outside this closed Starbucks. He gets so mad. He stands up and actually he's going to hit me and then goes, grabs the chair and throws it at the window at the Starbucks and then stomps off. And I go, guys, that's why he was not chosen to be the Bible talk leader, amen? But before that, every good news would share flattering things about me and how awesome you are and all this stuff. But the moment he didn't get what he wanted, that hatred came out. And, and flattery is unreasonable over the top praise in order to get something from somebody. And it's an ugly, ugly sin. In fact, false doctrine uses flattery to win people according to the Bible. Wow. Um, I've had people give me gifts and then call me later and say, how come you didn't say thank you? <laughs> so you had a motive then. It didn't come from pure love. I'll never forget there's this brother, one sorry, I'm telling all these stories here. But there's this brother one time, he wanted to date this sister that was in my ministry. And, you know, she, she, there was another brother that liked her as well that was in my ministry. And so the brother, he was in a church in Chicago, he calls and he's like, hey bro, um, so I just want to get advice about dating this sister and pursuing her. I said, uh, well bro, there's another brother that likes her and I think she's kind of back and forth, but you know, all's fair in love and war. Um, <laughs> take her on dates, you've got a chance. And this is a brother that had been lifting me up, flattering, and then he goes, well, I appreciate that. Advice is just advice. F you. And hey, you know. And I'm like, okay, did that just happen? A goat. We can't be weird, guys. We as leaders are servants of God. I have people come up to me, you're like my father and stuff. No, I'm not. I'm a brother in Christ. Jason's a brother in Christ. Your Bible talk leader's a brother in Christ. We are partners in the gospel for you. So I'll just quote sermons on Facebook to get like flattery, you know, and, and this sort of thing. And if you do quote them, please have right grammar. There's a brother that always quotes my sermons and makes me look like I never graduated elementary school. Amen? Amen. You know, the final closing point is the blessing of the righteous and the cursing of the damned. Um, 
We're about to come in for a landing, but this is a very serious topic to me personally. Uh, so hang in there, we're circling the airport right now waiting for the, the landing strip to be open. But you know, Matthew 25, verse 41 and 46, it says that hell was not prepared for people, but prepared for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want anyone to go there. In contrast to the heavenly kingdom that was prepared from the beginning of time as a special place for his people. And there's not going to be any sentimentality on this judgment day where this great separation occurs. Someone I was studying the Bible with told me one time, uh, he said, Mike, is, is homosexuality a sin? And I said, you know, went through the scriptures, well, why do you ask? And it turned out he was homosexual. And he said, I want to be a Christian. I just feel like you're asking me to give up who I am and my identity. I said, I absolutely am. Bro, I'm calling you to be a better version of yourself. I'm calling you to crucify that identity and get the most incredible identity of all time. Allow Jesus Christ to live through you. Are you with me right here? And that's the message of hope so that we can avoid that judgment day. But the sexually immoral, the homosexual, the adulterers, the witchcraft practicers, all these people the Bible says will be in this place that God has to send humans to. He didn't make for humans. But he has to because he's a holy and righteous God. And we have the Bible that tells us how to get there. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.11. We fear the Lord, so we try to persuade people. You know, in Acts chapter 2, if you'll turn there, please. In Acts chapter 2, we see the first gospel sermon. I really want to talk to those who are visiting here. In Acts 2, verse 36, Peter's preaching the gospel. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So right after they said that, all of them got baptized, right? No. Verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation and the 3,000 were baptized. Part of preaching is warning people, pleading with people. Let me go, well, I just don't want to push the Bible on people. No, you want to push it on people because you're rescuing them from going to an eternity in hell. That's why we do what we do, brothers and sisters. I'm begging you today, get saved. And Peter didn't say do it by saying a prayer. Don't believe this garbage that Joel Steen and Billy Graham and these false prophets preach. Believe the word of God. Don't believe navigators on campus that navigate you straight to hell with the false doctrine of praying Jesus into your heart. Say, I'm part of that group. It's got a lot of good people. Yeah, and there are a lot of good people in hell. And in hell, they're not going to be wondering, oh, I wonder if baptism was necessary for salvation or not. In hell, they're not going to be wondering, man, I should have shared my faith. They're going to have a burning desire to share their faith. And I say, let's have a burning desire now in our hearts instead of burning in hell for eternity. I'm begging you to make a decision. You know, I remember I appreciate Sir, one of our young Christians, and, and I said to him, I got baptized last week. I said, dude, if, if Jesus, if you knew Jesus was coming back at nine o'clock tonight, now no one can know that, we don't believe that in this church, but if you knew that Jesus could come back at nine o'clock tonight, what would you do? Because, oh, I'd get baptized. Just makes it clear, doesn't it? Yeah. So I gotta ask you if you're struggling, if you knew Jesus was returning this afternoon, what would you do today? Wow. I don't think it'd be like, man, should I break up with my girlfriend or not? Nah, is this what really the Bible means in Acts 2, 32 or 38? And you would be ready to rock and roll. You know, uh, Nick and Deo Infantino, they lead the uh, church in Bahrain and are good friends of mine. Nick was in San Francisco at one point a long time ago. And, um, you know, I was so excited, I was discipling Nick at the time in New York City. 
and he was going to have his wedding to get married to Deo. And it was a beautiful wedding. It was, you know, it was outside, a little hot, but amen. We sat there and we go um, to the reception. I always look forward to the reception, amen. Got all the food and everything. Not the dancing, you don't want to see that. But I go and Vic Villanova's there. He's kind of like the, the, the guy who's checking people in. And I said to uh, him, I said, oh yeah, we're checking in Mike and Chanel Patterson. He looks at the list and he goes, bro, you're, you're not on this list to come to this reception. I go, bro, I disciple Nick, I'm on the list. He goes, no, and then I just had this sinking pit in my stomach that, oh my gosh, I didn't RSVP. I forgot. <laughs> when you forget something, it's not a priority. You see, I knew Nick, but I didn't follow the protocol to get in. And there are a lot of people that know Jesus, but they haven't followed the protocol to enter his kingdom. <laughs> Repentance and baptism. Now, the analogy only works so far because a couple didn't show up, and so they let me sit there and had to be embarrassed with a different name tag on the table or whatever, but amen. Amen. <laughs> Philip III, King of France, last words on his deathbed. What an account I shall have to give to God. How I should like to live otherwise than I've lived. And he died. Socrates' last words, all the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail, perhaps some divine words. Volatar, the famous skeptic of Christianity, said, I'm abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months of life. Then I shall go to hell and you will go with me. Oh Christ, oh Jesus Christ. In 20 years, Christianity will be no more was a quote that he said earlier in his life. And on his deathbed, he was thinking about God. Sigmund Freud, the famous Psychologists said this meager satisfaction that man can extract from reality leaves him starving. <laughs> Prince Henry of Wales, tie a rope around my body, pull me out of bed and lay me in ashes that I might die with repented prayers to an offended God. Oh, in vain, I wish for that time I lost with you and others in vain recreations. Cardinal uh, Borgia said, I have provided in the course of my life for everything except death. Now, alas, I'm to die unprepared. Ludwig van, van Beethoven, the famous composer. Too bad, too bad, it's too late. When I was a kid, my mom claimed to see ghosts and different things like that. And she told me during a dark time in her life that she saw a vision of people screaming and running in terror with their skin falling off of their face. And she said, I knew if I looked back, I would die because I would see Satan himself. I'm a kid. <laughs> and I'm like, I do not want to go to hell. And from that point on, I wanted to find God. When I was seven, my biological father, who I did not know, took a gun and shot himself. And I go, where did he, is he gonna go for eternity? And there's a preacher that shared this story. Um, his name was Jack, and he was kind of seen as fanatical for sharing his faith so much. And someone asked him, Jack, let me know why you're so caught up in soul winning. You're on the verge of a fanatic. What's behind all that? 
He said, one night I awakened by this piercing scream from my sister. I ran upstairs to her bedroom and there she was sweating in hysterics. I shook her and I could not get her attention. So I had to slap her. I said, what's wrong? You had a dream? She said, no, no dream. I said, you had a nightmare? She said, no, it was real. I said, what happened? She said, Jack, I just got back from hell. And after a few miles of the glitter and the lights and all of that which deceives mankind, there was nothing but desolation. It was a bummed out situation. It's nothing but desolation and hopelessness. You walk towards the gates of hell knowing that you will never again be free. I got to the gates of hell and the keeper said, hold it. I stood outside hell and I saw people whose faces were twisted and tongues were thick and eyes bulging and hands split, drip, dripping blood. I said, sir, please let in some air. And he said, no air in hell. Then I said, kind sir, let them have a drink of water. And he said, no water in hell. Then I said, if it's true, let them die. And he said, no death in hell. She said, my God, how long will they suffer? And he said, forever and ever. Hell has no exit. There is no death. She said, just as I turned to leave, he said, go back and tell the story. And just as I turned, I saw daddy. And I said, yep, our daddy is in hell because he never got around to doing the most important thing. He schooled us, he fed us, but he never got around to saying yes to Jesus Christ. Jack concluded by saying, I win souls every day so that nobody else's daddy has to go to hell. It's great. It's great having 20, you know, 20 baptisms in a week and passing a thousand, but guys, a church of a thousand could be baptizing hundreds every week. That's where we're going. The, the church, the size can have thousands and thousands of people in the city. And as I come, I'm landing now, amen, I'm getting in the middle of the ship. I haven't looked at Jason yet, but I'm, I'm going down there. Um, God has three deadlines. One is death. It's done then. Two is the return of Christ. And three is what could be called blaspheming the Holy Spirit or a hardening where you can't return to God. And it's the third one that concerns me in this audience today if you're visiting. You say, what's that mean? Well, Isaiah 55 verse 3 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. This implies there's a time you can't find God. Pharaoh and the Old Testament the Bible says he wouldn't let the people of God go and that he hardened his heart 13 times, I believe. Uh, and the Bible says God had to harden his heart eight times. He goes, I'm sick of you killing babies and not letting the people of God go worship. You're done. There's no hope for salvation. You're going to be using an example. Esau, we go, well, he just ate. He was hungry and stole the inheritance. Sought repentance in Hebrews 12 with tears, but couldn't find it, the Bible says. The third deadline where it was too late to come back that Jesus says is unforgivable. It's not that God doesn't want to save us. It's that we've hardened ourselves too much to even be savable. The sun, if you put clay... And if you put wax, one's going to melt and one's going to harden. Which heart is yours? Wax or clay this morning? That third one scares me. Romans 1 talks about how God hands you over to the penalty. This church service might be your last chance to ever respond to God. Because you can walk out that door and be hardened forever. You go, well, I haven't killed anybody or something. There have been murderers that have become Christians because their heart was soft to the gospel. There have been people that just tell a white lie, they're done. Don't think in levels here. Respond to the Spirit of God today. You know, today I want to call you to recommit to having the love of Christ in your heart if you're a disciple and your love for your brother and sister. Let's be sheep. If you're visiting, I want to call you to get baptized tonight. To say, don't, don't let me go. I want to study the Bible. I want to become a Christian. Maybe you think you're already a Christian. Study the Bible anyway. Amen? Because yeah. a lot of us thought that already. Okay, so just trust me right now, but you're going to show you the scriptures. Are you with me right here? Why? 
because there'll be a day where all nations are gathered around the throne where a great separation occurs and the cursed will be damned to an eternity in hell but we are not of those who are cursed we are blessed and that word blessing we know means happy and we've been given this kingdom prepared from the creation of the world and the Bible says Jesus will wipe away our tears on that great day I believe those last tears are the tears of watching those we loved go to the pit and yet Jesus wipes away those tears and I love a song by Jeremy Camp called there will be a day and it says I try to hold on to this world with everything I have but I feel the weight of what it brings and the hurt that tries to grab the many trials that seem to never end his word declares this truth that we will enter in those rest with wonders anew but I hold on to this hope and the promise that he brings that there will be a place of no more suffering there will be a day with no more tears no more pain no more fears there will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more we'll see Jesus face to face but until that day we'll hold on to you always. I love you guys and to God be the glory. Yeah.